So once again, welcome everyone to the webinar we organized today um, about dynamic discovery. Um, we will be um, presenting to you, let's say, a, a relatively uh, fundamental uh, webinar about the, the specifications and about the conceptual way dynamic discovery works, while, of course, also hinting at some of the more practical questions that you, you shared with us in your uh, in, in the, the, the registration form. Uh, let me first uh, start with a quick introduction and then I will uh, hand over to my uh, colleague Jose Richtashik for uh, the uh, largest part of the, of the webinar. Uh, he will be the one um, explaining the dynamic discovery to all of you. Um, I thought uh, we might start with, uh, ah, sorry, before actually I, I, I move to the, to the actual topics, let me do a bit of house, uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, as some of you may have already noticed, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, you, you or your names will not be part of the recording, so normally this is not going to, to include uh, your uh, private data. Uh, but this this way you you are aware. Of course, please place your your questions in the chat section, and we will make sure not to read out the name uh, when we read out the question. Um, and likewise, you cannot unmute yourselves. Therefore, please raise your hand um, if you want to speak, and uh, we will unmute you at uh, the right moment so that you can uh, take um, uh, well. You can you can uh, speak uh, or ask your question. So with this in mind, uh, let's uh, move on to the next slide. Um, I wanted to start today because I, I, I looked a bit at, at, at uh, those of you who registered and I see that we have quite a um, stable audience to many of our webinars. So I, I decided to do a bit less of the, of the usual uh, parts that, I've, that I think you heard already too many times by now. So, I wanted to start today by, um, uh, by with, in a different way, which was to show you a little bit um, the, the place or the, the area where dynamic discovery comes into play into any delivery network. And to do that, let's look at um, a message exchange infrastructure, which is established in our case, of course, using a delivery access points. So as I'm sure all of you know, um, you can have a distributed network established um, or emerging out of um, creating and configuring to, to interact with each other a number of delivery access points. You can have uh, as many as, as you like, of course. And the, uh, let's say, mesh of communication will be different from one project to another. But in any case, in larger projects, you will typically be in a situation where you're not only connecting uh, six uh, access points, as you see here, which is, of course, just an uh, illustration, but really uh, a, a much larger number. And there, the, the, the delivery building block offers two what we call uh, participant discovery models. Uh, one of them is, is the one we typically refer to in other presentations, other webinars, which is the static discovery model. I should not even call it discovery because there's not any discovery taking place. It's more static configuration, let's say, where the access points in the network uh, that uh, one of the access points can communicate to are configured statically uh, on the side of the access point, let's say we take as our our proxy. Uh, so if if I'm access point A and I need to communicate to access points B, C, D, and E, I will uh, have a file where uh, the addresses and certificates and so on of access points B, C, D, and E will be statically configured, um, or or manually, if you will, uh, configured. Whereas uh, what we will do today uh, is to present uh, the alternative option to this, and Jose will explain much more in depth. Uh, when that comes into play, where uh, you, instead of uh, manually keeping track of all of the access points that you may want to communicate with, you go to a different approach where this is handed over to a um, system made out of additional components than the access points that will mediate, let's say, the discovery of participants and of access points. I will let uh, Jose uh, explain this in more depth, but this gives you at least uh, an initial idea of where this places into the e-delivery ecosystem. Uh, with this, I also wanted to highlight on our service offering canvas, which you've seen many times before, uh, what we will be covering today. So the, the parts in red um, are really what, what we will be trying to, to go through. It will be a bit of a mix, uh, but let me present uh, to you more specifically, and then you will uh, see when each of them is covered during the presentation. 
so on the on the one hand we have the the technical specifications uh, which uh, you see at the bottom of the slide i sorry i don't point them out with my mouse but i am using a different screen and if i look at, at the mouse i will i will not really look at you anymore so i prefer that you that you see the slide without uh, the mouse um, so coming back i was saying that at, at the bottom of the slide we have the specifications first of all just like with everything else we do uh, specifications come come first and we have both specifications about the SMP component about the component which is called service metadata publisher where the metadata about access points is published as the name suggests and also the second one SML uh, which is a service metadata locator so this is where you can locate the publisher essentially um, and uh, linked to these specifications there are of course products uh, we develop one of them in the case of the SMP specifications called DOMI SMP um, similarly, in the case of the SML specifications called DOMI SML. So this is what you see on the blue side of the screen, the, the, the faint blue uh, on the left, where I highlighted the SMP and SML uh, software products. Of course, uh, especially in the case of SMP um, specifications, we have additional products that have passed the conformance testing, which you see in the middle of the screen highlighted in red. So the conformance testing service allows software vendors, service providers to uh, pass the, the, the tests which um, allow us to confirm that uh, software products that they develop or services they develop are conformant to the SMP specifications. So this is the role of the conformance testing service you see in the middle of the screen. And finally, something we will not be speaking a lot to, about today, perhaps in a future webinar, is our SML service. So the service metadata locator service, you see it under the heading managed services. Um, this is um, an operational arm of our building block where we take the product that is on the on the left hand side on the blue side and we operate it in the commission uh, data center together with the dns uh, system so that we can provide this as a service as a baseline service for uh, projects that are in their early stages especially so with this i, I move on and i will give you a few uh, slides in a few slides some some updates about either the specifications, the conformance testing service, or the software that we are doing. And after that, hand over to Josef for, for getting into the, the explanations about SMP SML. So first of all, this is the current list of conformance solutions or solutions conformant to the current version of our specifications. This is version 110 of the SMP specifications. And you see we have uh, 10 products listed on the on the current slide. These have all passed the conformance testing in the previous years. You can find this, of course, on our website, and this is a dynamic picture, which, of course, we hope will evolve and be very dynamic over time. In this slide, I, I wanted to remind you, because you may have seen this or heard this in other meetings or other webinars, that we have prepared a new version, a version 2.0 of the SMP specifications, um, that we will be launching for public consultation quite soon. And uh, this will um, be the, the first upgrade in five years of the SMP specifications, quite a significant upgrade at, at that, uh, where we will add support, for, first of all, for Oasis SMP version 2.0. As a reminder, for those of you who may not be familiar with this, our current version of the specifications 1.10 um, only supports Oasis SMP version 1.0. So Oasis, uh, again, for those who may, might be new to this uh, uh, building block, is uh, the standardization body that uh, has uh, created all of the standards that e-delivery is based on, the AS4 standard, NTBMS3, and alongside it, SMP and BDXL. So this is about the Oasis SMP uh, standards, and we adopt or adopted in our initial specifications, the SMP 1.0. Uh, in the meantime, OASIS also released uh, SMP 2.0, which we'll, we'll adopt now in, in our own specifications as of the end of this year. We also, uh, in this upgrade, allow publishing multiple certificates um, for a transport profile, which is very much linked to the use or introduction of OASIS SMP 2.0. And finally, we will support the uh, updated e-delivery S4 profile, which also has some changes. It moves from version 115 to, to version 2, and it needs certain uh, changes to the e-delivery SMP profile as well. These are included in the uh, new e-delivery SMP profile. So you can see the draft already available online. 
uh, we will share the slides after the meeting in a few days, so you will be able to, to click the link if you don't want to, to copy paste it right now. Um, maybe I will only very briefly speak about the public consultation process. So we invite you or those of you interested to look at the new specifications and to let us know if you find any feedback that needs to be shared with us. We will take that uh, into consideration. We will analyze it and review the specification in accordance to, to the feedback we receive. And of course, after this process runs, runs its course, we will eventually uh, publish the new version of the specifications, hopefully towards the end of the year. The next slide I wanted to very quickly share with you um, is again a slide you saw, but once one where I highlighted in, in kind of a red box the projects that are either using uh, SMP SM, SML today, and these are uh, this is the, the PEPOL one, um, uh, or that are preparing. Uh, so let's say they are not in production yet, but they are in preparation. This would be the European Health Data Space and the implementation of the FT regulation uh, projects where. I think at least from the FT side, uh, we have some, some colleagues that are, are attending this webinar. Uh, on the side of European Health Data Space, we equally are in discussions about how the dynamic discovery will be used in, in their context. And finally, while not formally being adopted yet in the once only technical system project, which is why I used a different style to, to, to highlight this, um, there are quite active discussions about um, future support of dynamic discovery because today once only technical system is being built with a let's say a custom approach to dynamic discovery um, and we are trying to um, discuss with them to see how to uh, fill the gap let's say so that they can also move to using the standard approach to dynamic discovery that you will hear about uh, today and uh, before I, I leave you in the capable hands of Jose, a quick reminder about our various user community, um, let's say, uh, options to, to, to engage with, with us. Uh, we have the newsletter, we have the interoperability forum, uh, events and webinars like you are, you are um, attending today, uh, Twitter feed, PeerTube and YouTube uh, archives of videos that, that uh, we took in the past, as well as the um, link to register for uh, getting our newsletter three times, three or four times a year. Uh, also, a reminder for those of you that may have taken part in the previous um, edition or, or, or issue of the interoperability forum that took place in May. Uh, we will do a follow-up meeting from that first meeting we had in May to open the floor to discussions. So, if you are interested uh, from either the SMP side of things or from the AS4 side of things to discuss with us. We invite you to register for the 20th, the 27th of uh, June um, interoperability forum meeting that we are planning. And finally, there will be a further webinar on the value proposition, which was tentatively scheduled for the 28th of September. It might move a little bit. Uh, and finally, we will share with you soon a survey to collect ideas and interest uh, for future topics for webinars. I will go over the newsletter since I already mentioned it. And with this, uh, I am not sure there is any room for questions for now, but please contact us if, if you have any questions about the webinar or about other topics. And with this, I would like to, to give the floor to Jose. Oh, hello. <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, so, yeah. so, hello, everyone. My name is Joža Ristašić, and in the following slides, I will present to you the Dynamic Discovery Service. And the presentation will be made out of three parts. In the first part, I will present to you um, one short story, which I will just use to present different uh, components which are used in dynamic discovery service. Then I will give you a quick overview on the dynamic discovery process. And in the last part, I will go again step by step over the dynamic discovery process and give you a bit more details on the real examples um, which, are, which are taken from the dynamic discovery service. But um, let's start with our story. 
As every good story, also this story has its own actors, and they are Stu and Bob. And they both work for uh, companies, which they have very well developed informational systems, and they want to use those informational systems to exchange business uh, messages with each, with each other. And in order that they are able to do that, Steve and Bob agree that they extend their systems with a new uh, component, which is called integration. And after the integration is well tested, um, well tested, they just exchange the URL addresses of the integration and they start to communicate with, with each other. But because they are sending messages over the internet, and we all know that the internet is not a very safe place, they secure their communication with HTTPS. And for that to work, they had to exchange also the TLS certificates. And after a while, everything worked fa fine for Stu and Bob. Stu said, let's increase this uh, communication with also other business cases and messages. And, <clears throat> and with the intention not to develop again the same features, they extract the integration into the dedicated module and reuse the component also for other backends, which they connect to the integration. And reusing the integration uh, greatly reduced the development cons costs in the beginning and also later maintenance costs, because now they have just one component to maintain for exchanging the messages. And, loose, and since the components were now loosely coupled, it was also easier to maintain and develop. And what was also a great benefit, at least still thought so, it allows different teams to be responsible for integration or messaging service and different team for backend systems. Because usually the backend systems are more content oriented, oriented and they are looking more how to automatically process the messages. But on the integration side, there were more security guys who would like to just transmit the message, whatever the message content may be. Um, on safe and secure manner, manner to the other side. And Bob also thought, well, this is also a good opportunity. Maybe one day we can spin off this integration module into the dedicated service provider so that we can also provide the services to the other companies. And at the same time also still thought, that's also good from my side, maybe if there will be some uh, messaging service provider out there, which will make make this uh, service in more cost-effective way, we can use that sometimes in the future. And there are also other good aspect, aspects of this um, extracting um, the integration into the new module, but I will not go through all of them. I will just continue uh, with the story. So now, when the integrational team was taking care of the integrational module, they want to enhance the communication. And that's why they add um, some labels. So first they wanted to add some labels to the messages. Since now many of the backends were using the same module, they want to know to which module a message belongs to. So they add conversation text, for example, um, what kind of um, service started this conversation and which kind of documents were used for the exchange. And in the other side, Bob used this um, to properly handle and route the messages to the right backends. And also they increased the integration modules with some basic validations so that they can detect invalid or incomplete messages, messages even before they ended to the backends. And since they are now sending thousands of messages per day or week, they want to make sure that none of the mes messages are locked so they increase also the reliability of the message transmission and they add new signals to the messages for acknowledgement and error signaling. And they also wanted to improve and harden the authenticity of the messages so they started to sign all the messages. But lucky for them, they didn't have to invent the new standard or new technical specifications for that. They found out that in, in the internet is already one standard, which where they already thought well all these aspects, and they start to use it. And this standard was AS4. And because now the integration was not 
anymore just small integration. It was very um, capable co component. They also rename it to access point. And since, no since now, the communication worked very well for Bob and Steve. So they decided to invite also other business component, business partners and colleagues. And to, to adding them to the network was very easy. They provided them the access point they developed before, before that, and they configured them into the access point. And in the beginning, that was very easy. They just add URL address, certificates, and business content for the messages like service and action for every new member who joins the network. And, and when the network grow, this become more and more harder because new members were coming, old members were um, determining, deter start, they go away, they add new services and process and new business cases to the, to the exchange. And in the end, it was quite a mess. Um, it became quite a mess configuring the SS point on time. And then one day Bob say, well, what's enough? It's enough. And he called Steve and say, well, we have quite a problem now because on our access point, we have thousands of messages which, which stuck because of the configuration issues. And he said to the Steve that they have to do something. And Steve just thought a while and then he said, okay, then let's have a meeting. I have one good idea. And the next day, Steve and Bob uh, organized a meeting with other participants of the network. And Steve said, in our company, we are using address book for, for normal email exchange. And it is used by all the partners, departments in the company. <laughs> and, and when we are composing the, the mail, we don't need to know what's the actual email behind the company. We just write in the email client the name of the address and then the email client reduce the, the right email address from the shared address book and we can send email. And something similar we can also do for our network. And he proposed that they add the dynamic discovery infrastructure with the address book components component in it. And then the final recipients will publish their addresses, certificates, and all their, their business service capabilities to the address book, and that address book will be up to date. And when someone will try to send a message, the access point will just retrieve the data from the, from the address book. And that, and also the upgrade of the access point will be very easy. They will just add a new part or a new module to the access point, which will be called the dynamic discovery client, which will have this option to query the address book. And all the participants of the network were very happy about it. And since they were not <coughs> publishing just the addresses, they were publishing also the service capabilities or of, their, of the participants, they say that they will rename the address book to the service metadata publisher. And when they were starting to discuss who will take care for the service metadata and where the, this service metadata publisher will be located, they found out that they have a problem because some companies, they already use their own service metadata publisher, but they couldn't externalize it so others couldn't use it. And then maybe in some other countries, the public administration provided such, such a ser services for free, but they were, they were only able uh, to provide them to, to companies which are in that country, but not for the other countries. And some of the participants already have service providers with such capabilities, and they were very happy with them, and they didn't want to change that. So they couldn't agree which service metadata publisher they should use. And then this time Bob came with a good idea, and he said, okay, then let, let us add another layer to our discovery infrastructure, which will have component for locating the right service metadata publisher which belongs to the right final recipients. And this component will be called Service Metadata Locator, and it will be lightweight as possible, and maybe if it's possible also to use already existing uh, technologies which are used by the internet. 
And now when they add this last component, they solve their problem and the network was able to expand and to have even more than a million participants. And with this last component, also our story ends. And I would like to note that even though that I made up now this story, I would like to say that there, there are already in production other networks which are using exactly the same comp components and some of them already have more than a million participants. And also regarding the slides, I would also like to point um, to the colors of different layers. For example, I use in this slide blue color for messaging transport layer, green color for service metadata publisher, and red color for, color for service metadata locator. So in the following presentation, when I will be talking about specific components, I will also have uh, slides in the right color so that you will know about which component I'm talking about. But before we deep dive into the technical de uh, details, I would also like to mention that for every for, that this network works smoothly, Steve and Bob establish the network community, which has also the network governance body, which we will call all now business domain owner. You already see in the story on the business domain owner in action when they were talking about how to improve their architecture, but this was not the only um, thing they have to decide when they were establishing the network. They, for example, for example, they have to also decide and document the documents they will exchange because this was very important for the backends if they want to process documents automatically. Then they also have to decide what kind of the what kind of participant identifiers they will use in their network and how they will format them. They also have to decide um, about the purpose of the network and the visibility of it will be this public network or it will be a closed co community. They also spend quite some time establishing the trust model for the network. And they also have to de decide on other things like how many SMP providers will be there, who can set up the SMP provider, how many SML providers will be there, uh, and who can become a SML provider. They also had to decide other technical details in dynamic discovery par and dynamic discovery parameters. I will talk about them a bit later during the presentation and many other things. So with this slide, I just want to stress out that in dynamic discovery process, the business domain owner also plays quite important role. But let's see now, um, or let's, let's have now a quick overview of the dynamic discovery process. In the following two slides, uh, I will present this. And on the first of those two slides, I will just, starting, just start to explain how to start the dynamic discovery network and what things are needed to be done before the dynamic discovery can take place. So first thing, which is very important from security reason, is to establish network trust. Um, this step in testing phase or in demonstrating phase can be neglected, but it is very important in production because in the end, for example, NetBridge, it must trust that the message he received is trustworthy and that is valid. So that's why he must trust the transport layer he is using and with establishing the trust network in the architecture uh, is the one who is ensuring this. And because this is, um, yeah, the, this is important from the security reason, I colored this item red. The next thing, what they have to, what all participants in the net network must obtain is the unique identifier. And when everyone has the unique identifier, they can publish their service metadata to SMP. And SMP then um, set one record to the SML so that the SML knows who is actually who is actually uh, actually responsible for the right 
service metadata. For example, where the NetBridge actually um, publish the right service metadata so that other can use that. Now we are um, on, the, on the step where we can start to submit the message. So in our case, ConnectGlob create, creates the message. It sets the identifier of the NetBridge as the final receiver of the message and submits, submits the message to the access point. And since the access point doesn't have the config, all the configuration for the access point B, which is used by the NetBridge, he first query the SML, where is the SMP, where, can, where I can find the missing data. SML responds back with the, with the address of the correct SMP. In our case, is this, this is SMP2. And then the dynamic discovery where is the SMP for the missing data? And again, I would like to stress out when the dynamic discovery client retrie retrieves the data from the SMP, it must validate integrity and authenticity of the received da data before it hands them over to the access point for sending the message. And after the validation, if everything is okay, Access point uses those data and submits the data, submits the message to the access point B. And again, access point B at this time validates the message integrity and authenticity. And if everything works fine, it's okay. Then the backend can consume the message. And this, and with this, um, the dynamic discovery process actually ends. And I would like to also stress out that, the, that, the, that only the submission of the message is more or less manual. Everything else is done automatically and is done in very quick and short time. So now we will go step by step in more details. So first about establishing the network trust model. Uh, this establishing the trust model uh, enables the integrity and the authenticity check of all exchange data between the components. And this is combination of technical solutions and business domain network policies. But before I will give you some examples of the trust model, let's take a look which components must trust uh, which component and why? And let us start with the company and the SP. In this case, the SP must authenticate uh, the company before it allows him to um, to make to publish the documents to the SP. And also, the company NetBridge must be sure that SP is authorized and capable to publish the documents in the network. So that's why they must know each other and they must trust each other. And also when the NetBridge submits the document, the NetBridge company submits the service metadata document to the SMP, it must be very sure that nobody else cannot change the document which belongs to the NetBridge. And the same trust must be also established between the companies and the access point providers. Next trust must be established between the SMP provider and SML component because SML must allow only dedicated SMP providers to set the records to SML. A next very important uh, trust must be established between the dynamic discovery client and SMP providers because dynamic discovery client must trust the data which is received from the SMP. And then finally, also the access points must be able to validate the data, the, the authenticity and integrity which they exchange between them. And what are the options for establishing the trust model? Nowadays, the most common um, technical solutions or tools for that are to use HTTP, so mutual TLS authentication and electronic digital signatures. And for that, 
we need also to have digital digital certificates. And to trust the digital certificates, there are many different options. And the first one I will mention is to have dedicated domain PKI for the network. In this case, the network establish one certificate authority, which is responsible for issuing certificates for all components in the network. So, so before the certificate authority issue certificate for, uh, for let's say SMP, it validates the identity of the SMP component owner, and then it delivers the certificate in a secure way according to the network policy policies. And then when this certificate is used for establishing the trust, it is trusted by default. One example of this kind um, domain and trust model is for example, PEPL, when where they have their own CA for issuing the certificates. But not all networks um, have options to create their own domain PKI, so they use shared domain PKI. And in this case, the certificate authority is issuing certificates for the domain. And at the same time, they are also issuing certificates for other networks and also other, pu other purposes. But when they are issuing certificates for a particular domain, they also made some um, special checks for the domain. And they tag the certificates with, for example, uh, with some labels, which allows uh, the network network comp components to check that this certificate was issued for the particular network. And this text can be, for example, additional um, text in the subject, and that can be checked with subject regular expression, or they have special, or special certificate policies, and so on. An example of this kind of shared domain PKIs, for example, a delivery PKI, where we can publish certificates for uh, for different where where for example you can request certificates for your network but you also have to be aware that uh, AWP PKI also issues certificates for others but for the, your network with agreement can be also add, we can also add some special text to the certificate which are specific to the network and then Let's go to the next trust model, which is domain trusted list. In this model, certificates, in this model, the domain network owner can allow all certificates to be used in the network, which of course met some um, level of, of security. And then the, com the component owner must submit the certificates to the to the domain owner, which can then publish the certificates. For example, they can create a dedicated web service, which can be used by the components to validate the certificate trust, or they can just uh, create one key store and publish it to, to their website, or they can even use blockchain technology where they can publish, for example, uh, hashes of the certificates to their, to their documents in, in the blockchain and as long as the certificate is in that document, is considered trusted for the network. So now, when the trust is established between the doc, between the components, the next thing what the network must uh, make sure is that all participants obtain unique identifiers for the for the network. And in the following slides, I will be talking about the participant identifiers and why they are important. They're important because they are used for message addressing. So when we are set, when we are creating a message, we set the participant identifier as original sender or final recipient. Then the identifiers are also used for creating SML queries. And they are also used for retrieving the data from the SMP, SMP instance. And what is most important property of the identifier, that is that it belongs to only one participant in the company, participant or company in the network. 
and what kind of types of participants or catalogs we can use. For example, we can have a custom identifier. Um, here in the last line is a custom identifier, which is used by the eHealth project. Then if the network is on the national level, we can use, for example, VAT numbers or, or company registration numbers. But if the networks, network works globally, so it's international, then we must use international catalogs of identifiers. And one of them, for example, is ISO 6523, which I will explain in more details in the following slides. But for example, company NetBridge has a G global location number, which he obtains from GS1 organization, and he would like to use this identifier for exchanging the messages. But Connect Globe, com Connect Globe company, he doesn't have this um, identifier, but he would like to use the VAT number from Belgium, the VAT number of the company. But because these two identifiers are not unique um, when we are talking um, globally, they are just unique uh, from the registrar authority perspective, they decided to use ISO 6523, which is a standard that defines structure for uniquely identified organizations which are using different registered authorities. And the identifier from this standard consists of two mandatory parts. One is called International Code Designator, which uniquely identifies the authority who issues the, the identifiers or code for the organizations, and it's up to four digit, digits. And for example, in the GLAN, the registration, registration, registration authority code is 0088. And for the Belgian Watt registration authority, for the Belgian VAT number registration authority, the number is 0206. And then the code from the registration authority is the next part of this identifier. And with this, NetBridge and also ConnectGlobe have a set of data which uniquely identifies in, in the, on in the international scale their companies. But how we can write down this, um, these three sets of data? For that, we have different options. And at this point, I would also like to point out that SP specifications uh, stated that participant identifier can be, can be consisted from two parts, scheme, which is optional, and the value. And for, let's say, formatting the identifiers we can use, for example, OASIS EB Core Party Identifier Standard, which is like example, like this, it starts with the URN because this is the URN identifier. And then after the constant part, which ends with party ID, hype and type is the catalog identifier. Then is scheme in the catalog, so the ICD number. And then the, in our case, GLN number of the identifier. And the AB core party, identifier specification says that this can be divided into the scheme uh, when the first part, the scheme part starts with the URN and up to ICD number and the value from the register, register authority. But there are also other types of part identifiers like paper part identifier, which is also used very much in the dynamic discovery. And here is the example of the paper part identifier. It consists again from one constant. It started. It starts for the ISO catalog six five two three. Starts with the ISO six five two three hyphen actor ID hyphen UIPIS, and there are double column, and then the ICT number and the value of, in our case GLN number of the net bridge. And the paper part identifier. Specific specification says that the scheme on in the scheme parts we write the constant 
and in the value part we write the ICD number and also in our case GLN number from the GS fund registrar. And I put these two examples on the slide at the same time so that you can that you can see the different party that the same party identifiers can be write write it down into the documents and used in different ways. So when you are joining the network or if you are establishing the network, it's very important that you that you define exactly how the participant identifier will be also formatted. And in the end, yeah, this is also the example from the eHealth project when they where they have their custom, custom identifier. They use the example from the PEPL where they have a constant for their scheme, which is eHealth participant ID hyphen GNS and the identity part of the, their identifier. And in this slide, on this slide, I would like to also say something how to write this into the XML documents because the XML doc because the dynamic discovery at the moment is using XML documents for for exchange the data. And the EB core part identifier um, the specification specifications for the Oasis EB core part identifier they state that the scheme part is set to the scheme part and the value part onto the value part of the participant identifiers. But I would like to note that in the eDelivery AS4 profile, we suggest to use the complete identifier as a value and that we don't use scheme because this is much better fit to Oasis SMP standard. And I will show you in um, a few examples later, what do I mean by that? And then <clears throat> if you go back to the party, to the PEPL part identifier, we write into the XML like uh, example below. So we put the scheme part to the scheme attribute of the party identifier and the value which contains ICD number and the code from the registrar as a, together to the value part of the participant identifier element. And this is also the example from the eHealth. And all of this is defined by the domain owner in their technical specifications how the party identifiers should be used in their network. So now we, this, now we define how the identifiers must look like in the network and all the participants in the network um, have their participant identifiers. Um, they obtain the participant identifiers. Now the next part is to register service metadata to chosen SMP. To start with the registration, first the company, in our case NetBridge, request, request the SMP, in again our example SMP2, to create a place for them to publish their metadata. And the SMP provider um, creates a web resource, which can be retrieved as a URL, um, which in the beginning, um, it contains the SMP URL itself, and then it continues with the party identifier. As example in the middle, and as you can see, the party identifier is URL encoded. So the columns are, are replaced with, with percent %3a character. And the web resource document, which can be retrieved if you put, let's say, this URL into the browser, is as example below. This is Oasis SMP 1.0 document service group. And initially set like uh, the example, but the company can then update this document to put more metadata to it. Then in next step, the company register their service metadata for the service they provide. And this is the example of the service metadata document. And as you can see, the document contains the participant identifier. Then it contains the document identifier, which is exchanged in the message, and also the process or AS4 service. 
Very important part of the service metadata is also the transport profile, which defines which uh, all the parameters uh, which are used by the access point uh, for exchanging the messages. This particular uh, value says that it should that we should use as a delivery as for profile. Then next important data in the service metadata document is the endpoint of the URL, which is used by the by the net, net bridge in our case, so the end company and the access point, and it targets to the access point B. And also the certificate, which is used by the access point B. The document also contains other data, like when the service is activated and when it expires, and also service description and also other useful doc useful um, metadata. And these are just the basic data. Um, the document, the SP document has also the extensions where the company can also put other important metadata to the document. So when the document is published, um, in this slide, I would like to bring your attention that there are different document types at the moment and why it's important that we know which kind of the document types we are using. Um, this is because when we are choosing the SMP service provider, we must be sure that the SMP service provider is uh, supporting the document you would like to use in our network. And also the access points or the dynamic discovery client extensions of the access point, they must also know how to parse those documents. So that's why it's very important to double check when you are choosing the SMP software or the SMP service provider, the documents, the documents type they support. And what are the document types um, and standards which they are defining them? For example, we have Oasis SMP 1.0, and this is the service group document example. Then we have Oasis SMP 2.0 and the document examples. And as you can see, they are almost the same, but still they have some um, differences which make them in, not compatible with each other. One is, for example, they have different namespace, and if you can see also the participant identifier element change a bit and also the service reference element also change a little and that's why it's important again to know what kind of doc document types the smp service provider or smp component supports and then in the end i would also like to mention the pebble smp um, the PEPL SMP document is um, defined in the PEPL technical specifications and is used by the PEPL network. So now at this point, uh, the NetBridge company published its service metadata to the SMP. And now SMP register the record to the SML, and this is how it uh, announced to the network that SMP is responsible for all the service metadata of the company NetBridge. But before I will show you how the record in the SML looks like, I would like to spend a little, uh, a few moments on, on what actually the SMB, SML component is. The SML has two main functions. <clears throat> One is to allow SMPs to manage the participant identifier, so to register them or delete them or to update them. And the second very important, important function is that allows dynamic discovery clients to look up, to look up those data. And therefore, the SML service has two endpoints. One is for management, for the management. It's used by the service metadata publishers. And the second one is for the lookup. And the lookup is based on the domain name system uh, protocol, so based on the DNS protocol. And since now I mentioned the first time the DNS server, may I just put uh, the short definition of the DNS server? And what is actually the DNS server? 
DNS server for now, we can say that it's a key value database of the internet. And may I also mention that we use this on every day when we are putting any URL address to, to our browser, these DNS servers helps us to find the right server behind the URL address. But before I give you more explanation about the DNS, I would like to go back to the management endpoint and the interface. And in the following three slides, I will just uh, give you quick overview of the services which are provided um, for managing the, the SMP entries. So one set of the services or operations are for managing or for, are for adding the SMP instances into it and has operations like create, read, update, and delete. And yeah, this, this endpoint is exposed or a HTTP SOAP SOAP requests. Then the next set of services are for managing the identifiers for the SMP, where, where the SMPs can create participants or delete the entries for the participants and list them. And there are also two very important services for migrating the participants from one SMP to another SMP. And those two operations are migrate and prepare to migrate. And then there are also the helper, help, helper operations, like SMPs can change their own certificates before they expire. And they can also create participant identifier entries into the DNS with more specific values. And there's also one method which SMPs can use to check if the participant identifier is already registered. And, and on this slide, uh, we can see the example of the SOAP request for registering the participant identifier to the DNS. And as you can see, it's very simple. It has the service metadata identifier. So SMP service publish SMP, SMP identifier and also the participant identifier. And when the SML receives this data, it creates two records to the DNS. I mean, it, it can create just an after or CNAME record or both of them. And these are the examples of those uh, records. So in the middle is the NAPTOR record and below is the DNS CNAME record. And the, C and the D DNS records, all of them, they, they have so-called the domain name, which is actually the key, which is also used to look up the data from the DNS. I will explain a bit later how the domain name is consisted. Then next data in the DNS record is uh, time to live. Um, time to live, so it's used for the caching. So when someone retrieves the data, it uses this, this uh, information for how, how many seconds it should cache this data. Then is the DNS record type, and then the DNS record value. I would just like to bring your attention that, um, that the, the difference between the NAPTOR and the CNAME, as you can see in the NAPTOR record, we have, the, we have a complete URL of the SMP, and in CNAME, we have just the domain part of the URL of the SMP. And so you need some additional data to create the complete so if you are using the CNAME, you need some additional data to complete, to create the complete URL for the SMP service. And then after record has also another additional data, which is called NAPTOR service. And this is because DNS can have multiple NAPTOR records for the same domain. And with this, we say that this record is meant for SMP lookup. And now how the domain after rec record is consisted or created. And um, this is uh, the template and I will explain it from left to right. First on the left side is so-called SML zone name. And this defines the search space of the network. And it is actually the domain 
which is owned by the SML service provider. For example, it's SML uh, hyphen service dotted EU, the network domain of the SML service provider. Then is optional part, which is him. And this usually maps to the scheme of the participant identifier. And then is the hashed value of the participant identifier and in after record, this hash, we use has hash SHA-256 and then we base 32 encode it and we remove the equal signs. So we use without padding and we set it in uppercase. And this is the example of the NAPTER record for the AB core part identifier. So as you can see, the URN, uh, hyphen oasis and so on, and the identity, uh, the part identity is hashed in the blue part of the domain. And then there's no ID scheme. It, we just continue with the SML zone name. But in the PEPL part identifier, um, where we use scheme uh, separately in the participant identifier, we put the scheme outside the hashing. So first we hash just the ICD number and the val value of the identifier. And then we put the scheme. And then in the end, we put also the SML zone name. And this is how we create an after um, domain name when we are using the PEPL identifier format. And if you are using the CNAME records, um, here, as you can see, the CNAME record starts with uh, constant, constant V and hyphen, and then is again hashed um, identifier, but in this case, we use MD5, and then the rest is the same as uh, with the NAPTER. We add ID scheme in case of the PEPL identifier, and in the end, we also add a similar zone. And yeah, you can also see the example of the CNAME records. And with that, uh, we completed the setup for the dynamic discovery. And now we will go steps uh, which are executed when we submit the message. So first, the original sender creates a message and it puts the NetBridge, in our case, NetBridge identifier as a receiver and it submits the message to the access point. And this is the example of the message. <clears throat> As you can see, the message doesn't have in party info um, two party identifier of the access point B because the company doesn't know that when they created the message. But as you can see, there's the final recipient identifier in the property with name final recipient. And also the message has service and action or document type and document type in which the message is exchanged. And when this message um, hits the access point, access points re realize that it doesn't have all the necessary data and he activates the dynamic discovery part. And first, the dynamic discovery creates a query for the SML. For lookup, it gets back the result which we were talking before. It's the replacement regular expression with the complete URL of the SMP. But in case of CNAME, it gets back just the domain name. And in, so in case of NAPTER, it just extracts the URL out of um, this replacement regular expression. And in below, in the CNAME case, it appends, it appends the HTTPS in this case. So it appends the protocol which is used in the network when you are accessing the, the SMPs and also the context. And these missing parts are defining, defining, defined by the business domain network. So if you are using the CNAME, you have to check their technical specifications. What are these two values? And how the DNS lookup looks like. So first, the dynamic discovery client creates the, the domain name. 
and it asks the internet. And who exactly does to who exactly does submit this uh, request? It submits it to the resolver, D resolver DNS. And yeah, you're probably asking where's the resolver DNS? This is actually already part of your network. It can be provided by your internet service provider, or maybe the business enterprise or company already set their own DN resolver DNS, or maybe sometimes your personal router has also cap capabilities to resolve DNS requests. And there are also other options. For example, you can use public DNS resolvers like Google or Cloudflare and so on. So the resolver DNS is already there for us. Um, we just have to, if you would like to have more information which resolver our net, network is using, we should just ask our network administrator and they should be able to tell us this. And then the resolver DNS, if he doesn't yet uh, have the answer for this request, he submits the query to the root DNS with the question, who is the authoritative server in our case for the top level domain in our case for EU and the root DNS uh, responds back with the address and may I also mention that there are that the root DNS is also set in the internet already and they are on 12 location over the globe and they know all the top domain all the authoritative servers for all the top domains we are using so the resolver DNS gets the address and then submits the question to, to authority to server for the top level domain, which is responsible for EU, who or where is the authority to server for SML service.eu. And again, he gets back um, the answer. And then he finally submits the, the question um, to the authority to server for sml service.eu, which is our SML service provider, an authority to server responds back uh, with the right value. And the server DNS then submits back to the to our application the value which it was searching for. And <clears throat> even though this seems quite um, lots of communication, um, this is done in a couple of milliseconds or even uh, faster. And again, we are already using this on every request we made on the internet. For example, where we put an internet address in our browser, browser, these steps are um, made for, let's say, that request. And now I, I would also like to mention something about the DNS security, because all of these requests are done uh, over the internet. The Internet Task Force uh, create a standard which is called the Domain Name System Security Extension, and it's meant and its its purpose is, purpose is to strengthen the authenticity of the received data, so that the resolver DNS can always validate the data he received from the different servers that they can be trusted, because if they are not trusted, it it shouldn't the resolver DNS must um, not use those data and from our part it's very important on when we are configuring our network that we are using always the resolver dns which are which has the dns security enabled and if you want to have confidentiality and secure protocol to the resolver dns then we are using different sets of standards for example we are using dns over https or DNS over TLS, and this one is used for confid confidentiality. Next important thing I would like to say about the DNS is uh, the DNS caching. This is important because it improves performance. It also improves the billions, the stability and the resilience. For example, if one of the authoritative server is temporarily unavailable, if the results are stored in the resolver DNS, for example, um, uh, this doesn't affect uh, the internet. But on the other side, it delays um, the changes. So if we change 
the value in authority to server. We must be aware that there are caches between the application and the authority to server. And we either we must clean the cache or we must wait so that the cache is expired. And you are probably asking where the cache is and how they cache. Um, first, I would like to bring back um, yeah, the, the 60 seconds, which I already mentioned in previous slides, in the, for example, in the Napter record. When authority to server respond back um, the record, it also tells for how many seconds the record sh should be cached. In our case, this is 60 seconds, but usually because the records are not changed so often, these values can be also a couple of days. And where's the cache? I already mentioned the resolver DNS. Then we have to be aware that sometimes our application doesn't query the resolver DNS directly. The request can be sent through the forwarder DNS, which is, for example, uh, inside our company in some cases. And also, if we'd, we would like to clean the cache, we also have to clean cache on the forwarder DNS also. And then also another very important cache is on the apl application level. So, <clears throat> Now the dynamic discovery, if we are back now on the discovery process, the dynamic discovery client retrieves the address of the SMP, which he must query uh, to get the, the right data from the right backend, which is used by the NetBridge. So he submits, so the dynamic discovery client submits the query to the SMP too. And how this query looks like? First, it uses the address uh, which was retrieved from the SML. Then it appends the participant identifier. Then it put the sub-resource uh, services, which is defined by the, the OASIS specifications and in paper case, paper technical specifications. And then it's the ID of the document in which the message uh, is sent. And the SMP, when you put this into, for example, browser, you get the service metadata. And this is the service metadata which was before published by the company NetBridge with one additional thing. It's signed with the SM with SMP and certificate. And this certificate and this signature must be used to on the, the dynamic discovery client to verify um, the authenticity and integrity of the data. And then I would like to yeah, bring back uh, or remind you again that from this data endpoint URL is retrieved, which is the endpoint of the access point B and also the access point B certificate. And you are probably asking where is the access point uh, identifier, which was missing in the initial uh, message, that is two party identifier. It's hidden in that certificate. So if you check um, the e-delivery specification or um, technical specifications from Apple, they say that the two-party identifier should use the CN value from the certificate of the access point. So now the access point um, retrieves all the missing data on the configuration from the SMP2 it's ready to submit the message to access point B. And message is submitted through the regular way and the access point B now also again validates the message, integrity and authenticity. And if everything worked, worked fine, then the final recipient um, that is company NetBridge is ready to consume message from the access point B. And with this, uh, the dynamic discovery process is finished. I would just like to uh, express again um, that except the step, ex with exception to step one, everything is done automatically and in very short 
and it needs usually very little um, time to be executed. And with this, uh, I also finished my presentation. Uh, in the end of the presentation, I would also like to say that I put um, specifications and standards which can be used in the dynamic discovery. So first the SMP references, which are used by the SMP components. And then uh, there are SMR references. So how to create um, the D DNS records and uh, how, for example, the SOAP UI um, endpoints on the SML looks like. And then standards for the part identifiers and uh, standards and technical specifications for the access point. And before we go to the session, um, questions and answers, um, I would like to um, take a look also uh, to the questions we already received. And one of them is um, that we should provide, for example, in this um, presentation, the overview of all the functionality and its, its existing implementation. In this slide, I just put the most important um, things, which I think they are important. For this, first is the dynamic discovery environment must have its own business owner, where they define technical specifications for part identifier, technical uh, and other technical details. For example, which message they will exchange, and also they have to define the trust model. Then next, um, the access points you can find on our web page or the conformance solutions. But at the moment, sadly, we don't provide yet um, which conformance solutions have the dynamic discovery clients. So you have to liaise with the vendors to check the support for that. But the dynamic discovery client must know how to create a DNS lookup. And also it must understand SMP documents for fetching them, validating them and parsing them. Then next very important component is the SMP component, which we use for publishing the documents. And the SMP component or SMP provider must also be able to register SML records to SML component. And then in the end, we also have to have SML component. Um, which has a DNS in behind it. And usually the DNS server can be bind mine. This is for example, in our service, but also other uh, DNS servers can be used like core DNS or power DNS and so on. Then the next uh, question was about work together with other vendors on certificate certification process. Um, something around this was already mentioned on the slides, which was presented by Bogdan. So we have a conformance testing service where you can um, test your uh, services or your software for Oasis SMP um, with eDelivery SMP profile or eDelivery AS4 profile. Then the next question was about uh, SMP and SML business aspect with implementation and scenarios in other EU member states. Uh, for this question, I would ask Bogdan um, if he can provide some data about this. Indeed. <clears throat> so a quick uh, uh, additional bit of information on the previous point about working together with other vendors and the certification process. Uh, just to bring everything together in, 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 in an answer. First of all, I think the, the best uh, avenue for, uh, for you to engage with us in that respect is to also sign up for the interoperability forum. We have a um, perennially open uh, registration to become a member of the forum or an attendee to the forum, let's say, which you will find on our, on our slides, the, the, the link to that, uh, to that uh, survey, which allows you to register is, is present on the slides. And I invite you to, 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 to sign up because that's where you will get a lot more information about um, 
uh, upcoming specification changes, the conformance testing updates and, and so forth. And then to give you a very brief overview, uh, at the moment we are in the process of migrating from the old conformance testing service platform to the new one. This new one is already live and we are, uh, let's say, fine tuning the, the, the use and the configuration of the new platform as we speak. Nevertheless, if we talk about uh, the SMP specifications, those have yet to be migrated to the new platform. So we are still using for the SMP specifications, the um, uh, old platform as, as the only option. Uh, but uh, throughout this year, we will also implement tests in the new platform for the SMP profile. And that means that uh, as of next year, you will be able to uh, use the new platform as well for validating the conformance of e-delivery SMP products. Uh, so this is just a quick, a quick uh, point. A second point is, of course, the, um, what I already mentioned, that we invite you to have a look at the uh, new specifications and to engage with us and provide feedback during the consultation process, especially if you see something that is in some way or another, um, let's say, detrimental or, or problematic for your solution. Um, and in general, uh, we will also be working on a new presentation of the conformant uh, solutions that we will put live as soon as it's as it's ready. So now on to the question about the, um, the implementation of the dynamic discovery in various EU member states. Um, well, I think we, we see many scenarios, international and national scenarios. So uh, to, to start from clearly the, the, the biggest deployment of the delivery uh, dynamic discovery, which is in the PEPOL network, um, this is of course an international and, and even larger than the EU member states because this is a, a fully global initiative at, uh, uh, for, for, for PEPOL. Um, where, of course, they use extensively dynamic discovery to um, figure out the access point which needs to be used in order to send an e-invoice to uh, an organization. And typically they do this based on the VAT number of the organization. So very briefly, the input to the dynamic discovery process is the VAT number of the company that needs to receive the invoice. And then the dynamic discovery process, as Jose extensively explained, will uh, produce uh, metadata about the access point, which this e e invoice can be uh, sent to uh, for, for reaching that uh, particular company or organization. Then a similar initiative with, with slightly different, let's say, uh, participants is, is ESPA. So I will not discuss it. It's a, it's a more recently established network. It has a stronger business component. Um, and they are equally, let's say, uh, active in this e invoicing space. We are currently then working with three projects, which I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, the European Health Data Space, the ones only technical system and the implementers of the FT regulation um, with each of them separately in order to address their particular intended use of the dynamic discovery infrastructure and specifications. Um, again, briefly, in the case of the HDS, the notion is a researcher or a state agency needs to uh, send a request for health data to a hospital, to a research agency, to some kind of health related actor in another member state. And there will be a system to have identifiers uh, for each of the actors in the uh, health data space. And uh, a consumer of data will be querying the dynamic discovery system in order to find out which particular uh, access point to send a request for data to. So there the, the notion is more, I'm doing a research project for cancer patients, let's say, and I want to have access to a number of, of uh, data sets from different places around Europe, and the dynamic discovery process will be used to, to determine the access points that such a request for data can be sent to. In the case of once only, this, as I mentioned, is um, currently not, so they are currently not using dynamic discovery as was presented today. They have a bit of a custom implementation and we are working with them because there are some, some gaps uh, which uh, we, we are looking to fill so that they can move to use dynamic discovery proper, let's say, in their scenario. And the business scenario they are trying to, to, to work with there is given um, an, a public authority that can issue a certain type of document, say a birth certificate, a university diploma, what have you, what is the access point that should be contacted in order to, to reach that particular organization, public authority, what, what, what it may be. Um, and then finally, uh, on the FT regulation side, the scenario is once again 
quite different, where the notion is that uh, government uh, entities would need to check uh, transportation data sets um, and they would need to find out which particular access point to request those transportation data sets from. Um, and there is quite a complex implementation between member states uh, or, or among member states, EU member states, and inside uh, or at the national level of each uh, of each member state. And finally, then we also heard recently about um, uh, in initial deployment of dynamic discovery in Sweden uh, in the digital uh, uh, agency or, or by the digital agency that uh, manages this uh, this um, in, in in Sweden. And uh, we are looking forward to learn a bit more, but. Uh, at the, 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 the stage we are at right now, we know that um, they have a kind of a framework to interconnect various actors in various business scenarios in which dynamic discovery is also a part. Uh, we don't have yet uh, that much information as, as things are at the moment. So I think uh, handing back to Josef for the next question. So next question was get familiar with the delivery SMP component. I hope I did provide a decent explanation uh, in general about the SMP components, but indeed I didn't um, provide, let's say, information how to set up, for example, our component to be used in dynamic discovery service. And for that, of course, if there will be interest, we can organize hands-on meeting in the future about how to set up setting up. Um, the ne network like this for the dynamic discovery using of course the domi SAP component and yeah another question was it would be great if you would present how to set up domi bus access point to allow all kinds of messages going in and out without any need to explicitly configure them in the pmod file initially um one initial PMOD uh, settings must be present in the Domibus access point just to give initial configurations. Um, but if you are if you are using dynamic discovery service, that eliminates the need that when you are adding new uh, participants or partners to your network, um, it eliminates the need for that. Um, so. So how does the PMOD looks like? Um, it can have static. So this is a static participant configuration when you can see that it has uh, initiator and responder parties defined. But when you are using or configuring Domibus to, to work in dynamic discovery or with dynamic discovery service, uh, we just don't put um, the initial initiator uh, in the PMOD. For example, for the receiver, we don't put initiator parties element in it and for dynamic sender we don't put the responder party elements um, to the pmod configuration and of course you can find much more uh, more elaborated examples on uh, the domi bus administration guide uh, the chapter dynamic discovery of unknown participants <clears throat> 